Mysterious Andorians? A reference to unrequited love? A return to a familiar star system? Here are all of the Easter eggs you missed in Star Trek Strange New Worlds Episode 2. The series' second episode, Children of the Comet, begins with a log entry from Cadet Uhura. She's still getting used to life aboard the Enterprise and is about to attend a dinner in the captain's quarters. There, she meets the ship's new chief engineer, an Andorian named Hemmer. But Hemmer is no ordinary Andorian. The normally blue-skinned and tented aliens who debuted in the original series episode Journey to Babel, Hemmer is a subspecies of Andorian known as Enar who live in frozen wastelands on Andoria, as seen in the Enterprise fourth season episode appropriately titled The Enar. When Uhura spots Hemmer chopping vegetables, she offers to assist, knowing he's visually impaired, as Enar are all blind. Spock points out that Hemmer's other senses compensate for his blindness, to which the Enar responds, Compensate? They are superior. It's also mentioned that the Enar have a form of precognition, and Spock helps demonstrate Hemmer's telepathic abilities. Both of these unique abilities were showcased in the Enterprise three-part story that introduced a young Enar woman named Jamel and her brother Garib, who, until now, were the only Enar ever seen on Star Trek. In that story, the Romulans kidnapped Garib and used his abilities to pilot a deadly new drone ship in an attempt to provoke a war between galactic powers. During his dinner with the crew, Captain Pike entertains with a story from his earlier years. He was chasing down a pantsless Nausicaan while working a security job and fell flat on his face after tripping over the alien's pants. Phaser still in hand. It's an incident that would apparently play at least some role in his switch to command, but it wasn't the last time a future Enterprise captain would tangle with some nasty Nausicaans. While we haven't seen Nausicaans that often, this brutish alien race made a memorable first impression in the Next Generation episode Tapestry. In that story, Picard dies and meets Q in the afterlife. He offers him a chance to go back in time and change his past. In doing so, Picard revisits a violent incident from his early days in Starfleet. While awaiting his first orders after graduating from Starfleet Academy, Picard and two friends have a run-in with some Nausicaans who attempt to cheat them in a game of Domjot. Defending his friend from a vicious melee, Picard is impaled through the back by one of the aliens, requiring him to have an artificial heart implanted that he'd carry for the rest of his natural life. Thankfully, it doesn't sound like Pike's brush with Nausicaans was quite so harrowing. The second episode of Strange New Worlds takes the Enterprise to the Persephone star system, a planet that is endangered by a massive comet that is due to strike its surface in a world-ending event. In his briefing, Spock says that the people on the planet are a primitive race with no way to know the threat they face and no way to stop it. With the people below unable to save themselves, Pike and the crew get to work on finding a way to divert the comet from Persephone 3. But this won't be the last time an Enterprise crew makes a visit to Persephone. It originally popped up in the first season of Star Trek The Next Generation, set nearly a century later. Though it wasn't Persephone 3, the Enterprise D visited the Persephone system briefly in the episode Too Short a Season. In that story, Picard and his Enterprise crew travel to Persephone 5 to pick up a renowned Federation negotiator, the elderly Admiral Mark Jameson. From there, they wrapped a Mordon 4 to oversee the release of prisoners taken in a terrorist hostage situation. Things don't go as planned, of course. It's revealed that Jameson himself may be responsible for the crisis, the fallout from another incident he was involved in decades before. Nurse Christine Chapel and Mr. Spock had a brief interaction in the premiere episode, and their encounter in Children of the Comet made it clear there's some serious tension there, at least from Chapel's side of things. As Spock, La'an, Uhura, and Lieutenant Sam Kirk prepare to beam to the surface of the comet, Chapel inoculates them with an anti-radiation drug. When she administers a dose to Spock, she openly flirts with the Vulcan science officer, though Spock doesn't seem to notice. Uhura does, however, and mocks him later in the episode, sarcastically referring to Chapel as his girlfriend. I am a Vulcan. We are too honest by nature. Your girlfriend must love that, huh? The Sparks are, of course, a direct reference to the original series in which Nurse Chapel, played by series creator Gene Roddenberry's wife, Majel Barrett, showed an open attraction to Spock and even got jealous of his relationship with T'Pring. It was in the episode The Naked Time that Chapel professed her love for him and in Plato's stepchildren, they even shared a kiss. Though in the episode it was while they were coerced by alien telepaths and neither was entirely comfortable with the encounter. Under the influence of a love potion, Spock himself became infatuated with Chapel in the quasi-canonical Star Trek the Animated Series episode, Mud's Passion. Where Strange New Worlds will take their relationship, 
remains to be seen. Inside the alien structure on the comet's surface, the landing party discovers a mysterious alien egg. Unable to get many readings, it's up to Uhura to decipher the inscription on the egg's surface and find a way to lower the comet's artificial shielding. If she can't, the comet will destroy Persephone 3. Uhura unwittingly discovers how to communicate with the egg when she begins humming an old Kenyan folk melody to alleviate her anxiety. As it turns out, the comet's intelligence communicates through musical tones. Die-hard Trekkies will recall that in the original series, Uhura had shown an aptitude for singing and was seen doing so on more than one occasion. She was most fond of a song called Beyond Antares, which she sang in two different episodes, The Conscience of the King and The Changeling. Later in Children of the Comet, Uhura and Spock sing together to communicate with the intelligence, and as Star Trek fans know, this wouldn't be the last time they perform side by side. In the 1966 episode Charlie X, Spock plays a Vulcan lute while Uhura accompanies him with her sweet voice performing a song titled O oh, on the Starship Enterprise. As the landing party works inside the comic to alter its course, Pike and the Enterprise find themselves confronted by an alien ship. The beings on board it refer to themselves as the Shepherds. They warn Pike not to interfere with the comet, which they believe is a kind of divine life bringer. This is a powerful starship that the Enterprise can't compete with, so they're careful not to anger them, but they can't abandon the mission to save the planet either. When they're finally forced into a firefight, Pike issues a command to get them out of there, barking, Escape pattern April Omega-3. This is a clear reference to Robert April, the former Enterprise captain who we met in The Strange New World's premiere. April became official canon in an episode of Star Trek Discovery, where his name appeared on a computer screen as part of a list of Starfleet's most decorated captains, alongside Pike, Jonathan Archer, Matthew Decker, from the original series episode The Doomsday Machine, and Philippa Giorgio. Given that April has an escape maneuver named after him, it's no wonder he's considered one of the best. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about Star Trek Strange New Worlds are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.